New York has always been a great dining town. It is easily the best restaurant city in America, maybe the entire planet. Each generation has had its players, the ones that changed things, started lasting trends, made their mark, transforming cuisines and neighborhoods in the process. In short, the impresarios. Today we'll meet one from the 90s, Drew Niebert. In a city with 18,000 restaurants, there's restaurants that have huge importance and others that just sort of come and go and one never notices. Well, the restaurant I'm standing in front of, Mon Roger, was a hugely important restaurant. I would argue that this was the restaurant that opened up fine dining in Tribeca. Prior to its opening, you had Odeon down here, a couple of blocks to the south, which was wonderful. Patrick Clark had a great sensibility of the McNally brothers getting started, funky kind of, you know, urban modern bistro dining, but this was French three-star, and kind of a new type of elegance. When Drew opened Monarche, it was the beginning of fine dining coming south of Canal. These days, there's tons of great restaurants down here. It's home to several four-star restaurants and three-stars. Back then, there was nothing. South of Canal, even Soho to the north, was a ghost town at night. This was the beginning of all of that. And we're going to get that story today. Drew, Monarche, the empire he's built with Myriad, and how this whole section's opened up as a dining destination. But we'll start with Mon Roche, we'll meet Drew, and uh, we'll do what we always do, we'll wing it. It's hard to imagine now what a big deal Mon Roche was when it opened. The context just isn't there anymore, but suffice it to say it was huge. The critical mass was in place, with Drew in the front and a young David Boulay in the kitchen. Great, inexpensive, casual French dining south of Canal Street was a revolutionary idea. Months into business, a three-star review from the New York Times, they haven't looked back. It's been three stars ever since. Were you looking for three stars? Were you looking for a... Well, I think we, we didn't necessarily have a three-star aspiration because we, we weren't a typical three-star restaurant. At that time in New York, the th right. typical three-star restaurants were uptown. Right. And right. What's great is that our quality and our thoughts um, generated what I consider this new style of three-star restaurant that the food critic at the time, Brian Miller, was right. uh, he really took a chance. It took guts to do what he did, giving a three-star restaurant with a $16 menu, three stars. Two investors and you. Yeah, it was $50,000 of my own money, $50,000 of uh, partner's money who we went to Cornell together, and then uh, another $50,000 from the Small Business Administration. And so with 150 we started. That was really not enough. We got $25,000 more from Mom. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. Came Mom. Up with the, Mom came up with the 25 to pay the bills. The restaurant business really is about juggling the uh, the creative and the financial, and if you can't do that, you're really not going to be in business for long. So, we made a decision that we felt we could maintain the quality of the food, but also maybe make it a little more efficient for the customer. And we did. That was what my goal was to make fine dining less pretentious and accessible to the dining public. The next step after Mon Roche, the next big opening was Tribeca Grill. Flush with celebrity partners, way west on Greenwich Street, this restaurant's instant success, maybe more than any other, paved the way for Tribeca as a dining destination. Celebrity restaurants are usually about the mood, not the food, so we broke the mold. Mimi Sheridan in her newsletter wrote, the real stars are the, the chef and the people running the joint. And we were off and running. I mean, people, Tribeca Grill is a credible restaurant because of its food and its service and its wine list. We got a grand award, one of only 110 in the world. But, you know, we were lucky. Robert De Niro uh, brought a great deal of attention and has continued to do that with the Tribeca Film Festival the last two years, so. The beginning. You're a New York kid born and raised. Peter Cooper's dive is in town. Right. Your dad was in the business as what? Well, my father was an attorney with the State Liquor Authority, which licensed restaurants. So it's a little like this, Michael. If you're brought up in a house where there's a piano and you're exposed to music by your parents, you might gravitate towards music. In our case, our father would take us out to dinner in some of the greatest restaurants in New York City in the 60s. And I gravitated towards food. I mean, and then also in the 60s, you had Julia Child on television, the Galloping Gourmet, my dear friend, Graham Carey, I watched him religiously. I used to come home from school because I could walk to school, and I watched the Galloping Gourmet at 12 o'clock, which my uh, my housekeeper was angry about because she always wanted, wanted to watch, the you know, Search for Tomorrow as the World <laughs> the Turns. The guiding light. Yeah. yeah, I remember, you know, so I would switch to <laughs> Graham Carey. And, and you know what? It just, I always wanted to do this. 
After spending his childhood following his father around from great restaurant to great restaurant, it was only natural that after high school, Drew would attend the prestigious hotel and restaurant management school at Cornell University. And as a freshman, I was walking the halls of Cornell once, and I saw a sign by the dean's office that said, looking for six students skilled in Russian service to sail to the following ports, Dublin, Oslo, uh, Copenhagen, Leningrad. I had really no experience to do that. Well, right, and for those of yeah. who don't know, this is yeah. old school. Yeah. I mean, Russian service isn't how to, how to, how to, how to pour vodka and, and, and tab no, your arm. No, no. Russian service is working off of your arm right. with a large serving tray, using a, a one hand spoon, with a fork right. and spoon in a certain right. manner, and serving you know eight or nine people, because that would right. be the table you're serving off of your arm. Right, but it's, it's a it, skill. It, yeah, typically you might see this at the Waldorf still in, in a banquet. Maybe. Like nobody does this kind of service in, no. a, in, in a But on the ships, also those platters that you're talking about are very heavy and the kitchen is downstairs by escalator. So when you're carrying a tray, which again, I did not even know how to do that at that time, uh, you probably have at least 50 pounds on your tray. And there were several accidents, I can assure you, where the tray hit the escalator and the sound of it. And, but that'll all be in the movie, Michael. That'll all be in the movie. The third big opening was Restaurant Nobu. Bobby De Niro introduced Drew to the sushi chef Nobu Matsuhisa at his little restaurant in LA. Lured to New York, Nobu took off like a rocket. There's a half a dozen of them around the planet now, and the one in New York is almost impossible to get a table in. So Nobu came to New York, came to Morris Hay for dinner. We walked over to the space that would ultimately become the Tribeca Grill. It was way too big for him. But I saw a kinship between him and De Niro, and when this space, availed itself. Keep in mind, we're on Franklin Street. Tribeca's right down there. The bakery's right in the middle. And Shiner Elza block the other way. Right. Um, I called Nobu, and, and the rest is history. What are you living on a Friday? You know what I'm saying? I think what sets uh, Nobu Matsuisa apart from the other uh, sushi chefs is his uh, inventory and repertoire of personal dishes that over the years, having worked in Alaska and Peru, and also on the West Coast and the East Coast, thank you, darling, that he has his own style. And we call them, uh, really, we call it new style. For instance, this is a sashimi salad right here. The, the tuna is seared, and the, the dressing is redolent of shallots, uh, green onion, wonderful olive oil, which is not typical in Japanese cooking. The daikon, of course, on top. But you should taste this one, uh, Michael. The thing about Nobu is that when the food hits your mouth, it's a flavor that you've never had before. You want half of this It's just amazing. Uh, we're chronicled in the papers and magazines constantly. It's incredible. It's the only restaurant that I know of that I see the same customers week in, week out, month after month, day after day. It's amazing. Kirk, this is fabulous. For right? those in America that don't know, this is what wasabi looks like fresh. It's much milder, if you ask me. Milder, but has a really, you know, wonderfully focused, pungent. Besides the fact that this fish is incredibly fresh, incredible, I mean, you know, you don't, you don't get three stars, you keep this place isn't taxed for nothing. I mean, Nobu, they get the best fish flown in from around the world all the time. But the way they handle and cut, I mean, I don't even know what this is, but take a look at this. Looks like a kitty scissors cutout class or something, doesn't it? And I'll t I'm going to guess in a minute, but I'm probably going to guess wrong. Let's just see. Oh. Wow. There were always a lot of eating establishments in New York. It was that restaurants were not that big a deal, and they were expensive back then. That was what my goal was, to make fine dining less pretentious and accessible to the dining public. That's something I think we really can take a lot of credit for. You know, it's restaurants like ours that have created that new generation. And honestly, I really feel that's part of my legacy in New York that I gave people because it does take courage and guts to open a restaurant because you're putting a lot of your own uh, ideas, emotions, and money on the line that I, I think that's one thing that we did. We motivated a lot of young chefs, those even that work for us and those ha that haven't, to become restaurateurs, and I think that's, I, I think they have a greater appreciation of what it is that a restaurateur has to go through. 
It was great. I really wanted to tell the story about Drew for years because every every town, every big city has these sort of restaurant empresarios who really in, uh, affect and inform a generation of, of restaurant people, of chefs, of owners uh, who set styles and trends. And there's a few guys like this in New York today. Uh, you know, Drew certainly at the forefront. Um, and in the last generation, we had them too. Uh, Joe Baum, uh, Alan Lewis, George Lang, Soule at Pavillon. But, you know, there was no TV back then to chronicle these guys, so it's sort of kind of tragic. I mean, if you're like I am, a, if you like restaurant history, you'll find them in books, but their contributions were enormous. You know, Restaurant Associates is a group, and, you know, George's Myriad, uh, um, Drew's Myriad group is really sort of right there now. Um, I'm doing a dish. Why this, why this fish is sitting in front of me? Because it's a classic. This black bass, you've got to go back to the early days of Montrachet, when, when Drew was the owner and David Boulet was the chef. And it's hard to imagine those two egos coexisting for long under any one roof, which didn't last forever because David was an enormous talent in his own right. And of course, Drew speaks for himself. Um, but that first early menu, David had a, a dish called bass and barregoule, which was a black sea bass, back then sort of a throwaway fish. It was a junk fish, a dollar fifty a pound delivered from the fishermen in Long Island. They couldn't get rid of them, uh, which is incredible because it's a remarkably good fish. David recognized it. Um, David did the black bass. Balagoul is a sort of a Provençal nage. It was sort of poached with artichoke bottoms and vegetables and very light, typical boulet style. Um, I don't cook like that, so I'll muck it up a bit the way I always do. Same fish, fabulous. This came off of a night trawler. We have fluke season open right now, came off a fluke boat. I've got another friend that called me up who got some on his fishing hooks last night, so I'm going to get a few more of these. This is a beautiful specimen. It's enormous. As far as these bass go, it's huge. It's beginning to show that coloration here. When they're really fresh, this turns kind of like a turquoise blue. Only exists for a few days. Only the freshest fish have this, and this is just beginning to get it. There's no rigor mortis in this fish yet. I mean, this is, if you look at the meat, it bounces back. The gills are, this is, just, this is as fresh as fish gets. I'm excited. I'm drooling. Get this fish. We're going to do it two ways, kind of with the poach things. I love that idea. I'm going to steam open some clams, some mussels, create a, a natural poaching liquid, natural salin, you know, salty poaching liquid with great flavor. Take the clams and mussels out, reduce that broth, hit it with a little olive oil, a little butter to round off the edges, fresh basil, some kind of a tomato. I want something acidic in there. Uh, fish got poached in that. And then I'm going to get another piece of bass, skin side, and saute it so it's crispy. So you'll have that bass kind of two ways, poached, delicate in this natural seafood broth, scented with basil, a beautiful asparagus in it. We have asparagus. It's spring down here, and these are just out of a friend's garden. I mean, they're beautiful. They're some of the earliest things we get to let us know that summer's on the way. We'll use the top halves, the little spears. Um, simple, wonderful, in that style of Montreche, when they use the best ingredients, they cook in season, the chefs are very, very creative, and uh, this harkening back to the early days with David and Drew, two huge stars on the rise who probably knew it at the time. First thing you have to do with a fish like this is scale it. So we're going to head out to the back deck like we always do and <laughs> make a mess. When I come back, I'll have fish scales all over me, probably, outdoors. And we're going to grab the fish right at the tail. I've got this in my hand because it's slippery. Yep, see? See? Yeah, flying away from you, are they, chef? Yeah, oh, yeah, nice, nice shot. Mm. It tickles. You can hear him laughing. It tickles under his armpit like that. We're going to open her up. Right down the, it went right down there. Look at that, look at the protein. I mean, look, if you can get the lights or camera, it's really hard, I know, but just look, I'll hold it up. Look at how perfect that is. Just shiny and firm, not a break in it. That's just a beautiful thing. Next one will go the other way. And we're done. Okay, so I'm going to get this fish, and like I said, I'm going to do two things with it. I'm going to poach part, and I'm going to keep the skin on both, and I'm going to saute the other. And I think what I'm going to do is cut it right around here. Yeah, I'll saute the thicker part. Asparagus. So I'm just going to hand pick a few out that I want. I kind of want them all to be the same size, and I want them to be small. That's fine. We'll blanch them like this. Salted boiling water, in and out for maybe a minute. You can't always judge a 
asparagus, the fact that it's small doesn't necessarily mean it's tender. The fact that it's big doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be fibrous. Sometimes the small ones can be like chewing on, you know, bamboo, and the big ones can be as tender as can be. So you just have to, you know, cut, play, taste, and see. All right, so here's what we're going to have. This is going to go one, two, three. I need all my mise en place at the stove. Fish, everything I need. Simple, simple, simple. I said shellfish are there. In a pan, a little garlic, very little garlic, a couple slices of just a little pepper to give it a little bit of warmth. Little pepper, garlic in the pan, shellfish, lid goes on, they open up, juice comes out. I take the shellfish out. Adjust that liquid. I throw in these tomatoes, which are okay right about now. Cut them in half, just boom, let them break down real quick. I'm going to put a chiffon out of basil in. Just going to split them. And I might not even split them. I just may do this, just score them, just so they open up a little. Sometimes this way they'll collapse a little, but they'll, this way the juice will ooze out, they'll retain their shape. And this pepper is just because I don't know why, but I just feel like it. Just a little background. It may seem like it's culturally inappropriate there, but sue me. Warm pan, hot pan, olive oil. Okay, it looks like the pan's warm. Not quite screaming yet. There's some smoke. That's what we wanted to see. You know what that is. Right on top of it, go step back. Shellfish. And as always, anytime you're trying to open clams in a pan, shake the pan, shake the pan, shake the pan, take a look. Sometimes you have some clams that aren't opening, tap them with a spoon. There's always a couple of tough clams in there that just don't want to let go of it, you know. I'm not opening up. It's not that hot. I'm not opening up, you know. And I see steam, which means the muscles are up, and you can smell the muscles. The muscles have opened. Now the clams have to follow course. I'll take a peek. Let's see where we are. I'm going to open this up. Careful of the steam. Ooh, ooh. One reluctant clam. Hold on. We got the. I told you there's always one of them. Hey, you. Join your buddies. I want to start pulling some of this stuff out. We're going to put her in here, skin side down. Put the lid on. This is I'm poaching this very low temperature. I've got it down on the simmer setting now. Um, want it to go very very slowly. Uh, so far, you haven't seen me put any salt on anything. Shocking, isn't it? But. When you're using shellfish broth, be careful. Um, clams have that natural, you know, it's ocean water. Same thing with the mussels. I even find sometimes when you're cooking with lobster shells and shrimp shells, they have a natural salinity. So having over-seasoned them many times, I've learned at, at this late stage to be careful with salt when you're dealing with shellfish. You would always salt it at the end, which I never usually do. All right, I'm going to throw in these tomatoes now. You see that fish is just... Coming along. Oh, clam opened up. Ha, 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 ha. I knew you'd join the party. Yep. Oh, and peppers. Let's see how slowly this poach is going along. It's getting close. You can see the tomatoes beginning to wilt as well to break down. This thing wants the lid back on it. You are going to get a little bit of salt. Not too much, but a little. The old rule in restaurants is the side that you're going to serve facing up, the side the customer is going to see, is the first side that goes in the pan. So side down is the side that's going to be served up. It's a picture of pancakes. When you make pancakes, the side that you put in first down is always the most beautiful side. Almost the same with everything. So I'm going to serve this skin side up. So it's just going to go skin side down in the pan. We're going to test the fish for doneness. And you should do this at home. I mean, professional chefs do this all the time. Why leave it up to guesswork? You know, you can't see inside the fish. And you can't quite tell always by touching. So you get a little probe. You get a little stainless steel probe. And into the center, back it off a little so you know it's in the middle of the fillet. Not quite yet. I wanted it about, you know, just a little warmer than, than my lip is. Not too hot, but just a little warmer than my lip. Then I know it's done. Very gentle here. Out she comes. Now we're going to reduce this liquid. In goes the asparagus. Get that hot now. As it gets down to about half of where it is now, olive oil and butter and basil at the ends.
olive oil. Turn the heat down. Butter. Basil. You see it just thickening right up in front of me. See that? That's just boom, beautiful. See the skin? Gorgeous, crisp, beautiful. Now we take the filet that's here. We have it on the plate. Look at that. Look at that color. Oh, now, you know that's going to taste good. lay it right across the top here. I don't want any of that oil from the pan, so into the side towel, get that oil off like this. That does look good. I need a fork because you know what we always do here? Let's challenge the chef and see if the fish is really done. Today's seafood challenge, Mike Talamanco was given a chance to poach and saute the same piece of fish. First, let's check the poach piece for doneness. Ooh, ooh, ooh. How perfect. Let's just take a piece out. Take a look at this, how beautiful and white. I can't use my fingers because everyone says don't use your fingers. Take it right off the skin and look at this. Looks like, looks like custard. Look at that. My eyes are glazing over. God, that's good. I mean, it's the fish. It's not me. I didn't do anything. Got great fish, was lucky, because the boat came in, you know, like hours ago. Great shellfish. I mean, what did I do? Anyone, I mean, this is, you just don't get in the way, and it's good. Now, the tail section off, open it up. Oh, baby, look at that. That is fish that's perfectly cooked. The proteins are just set. And again, this is going to be, I mean, I, you know, luckily, I just got a boat coming in off the dock, but wow, little broth. Mmm. has a whole different flavor, too, because this one was sautéed. You get this really great flavor off the skin of black bass when you give it this crispiness. This, you know, I don't know what this has a typical, more of a flavor I recognize. Again, with my eyes closed, I would know this was black bass. This is remarkable, almost like halibut, this rich, really rich, delicate, sweet, nuanced flavor. Let's just see what this guy looks like right in the middle. I don't know why I'm making such a mess of this plate, but you saw the beauty shot already, right? Let's just go in and cut again so you can see this and that's just look at the flakiness it's just coming apart look at the big piece from the head section it's just it's fish when it's done just coming apart this is beautiful i mean this is simple you know monroche good restaurants great restaurants have a couple of things in common and one of them is you know 95 percent of great cooking is great shopping get great ingredients in that back door don't get in the way and you can almost be assured the results just speak for themselves. What was this? The juice from the clams and the mussels thickened, olive oil, tata butter, little basil, asparagus that just got picked, fish came out of the... I mean, hello. That simple. It really is that simple. Stuff's in your backyard. Find the good stuff that's fresh and that's what you cook at home. That's what the chefs do. That's one of their big secrets. So, until next time, Drew, thanks for all you've done for New York and um, continue to do. We'll get somebody else in there next year, one of the other... There's not that many of them, but hopefully next season another impresario. And signing off, my first apartment was in Tribeca, back when it was nothing. I remember that. What a change 20 years have made. Till next time, buy the freshest stuff you can get. Don't get in the way and cook it at home. You'll save a bundle. Take care. And eat it at restaurants once in a while, otherwise I won't have a job, will I? Till next time, I'm eating. God, this is, you almost need a spoon to pick this up. Kurt, you've got to eat this.